to virtual open hours. Today's topic is pollination, and we are celebrating pollination all throughout the month of June because next week is actually National Pollinators Week. So we're celebrating all the important roles that our pollinator friends uh, play in the plant life cycle. So why don't we just dive on in and talk about what is pollination and what does it mean when I'm saying a pollinator? So pollination is the process of where the pollen from one plant or one flower enters another flower and causes a fruit to develop. And the, inside the fruit, there's gonna be those seeds. So pollination is a fertilization process that encourages the growth of new plants and new flowers and new seeds. And of course, those fruits that grow that have the seeds in them are not just important in uh, seed pods or seed holders. They are delicious things to eat. People like to eat fruits. Animals like to eat fruits. Any of those fruits like apples, oranges, uh, different berries, strawberries, blueberries, those all rely on pollination for them to grow from the plant. Now we have the help of a lot of different animals that act as pollinators and they help disperse the pollen. So for example, a lot of different types of butterflies are considered pollinators and many different types of beetles, especially lady beetles, ladybugs are pollinators. Uh, some even flies, a lot of different flies are considered pollinators. Birds, very specifically hummingbirds. Not all birds are considered pollinators. Birds do help to disperse seeds after the seeds are produced and help to move around the locations that plants are grown, but only hummingbirds are pollinators. And we'll talk a little bit more about why hummingbirds and not all birds act as pollinators. And even our friends, the bats, there are some species of bats that are considered pollinators and help with that sort of production. And then of course, we can't forget our friend, the bees. The bees are probably the most popular pollinator. Now, as one of these pollinators, like a bee, travels from flower to flower, they're not there to eat the pollen necessarily, although some, some bees can take some pollen back with them to the hive to feed their really young. But the bees and the butterflies and those hummingbirds like to eat the very delicious nectar that is deep inside the flower. So they're going to land on the flower and they're going to be looking around for that nectar. And as they're doing that, they're going to get some of this pollen stuck to their legs. So there's be, there'll be little bits of pollen inside each flower and it gets stuck to their legs, stuck to the back of their legs. And then they keep moving on. They move and hop to another flower. And as they're moving around on the next flower, some of that pollen might rub off and it lands on another different flower. Uh, usually part of the same species because there'll be a lot of different um, flowers part of the same plant species but as they're moving from flower to flower they got that pollen and then the pollen just falls off into the middle of the flower so we would call this cross pollination sometimes flowers uh, have pollen that's their own kind of enter deeper into the flower and that can cause pollination too but Really, we rely on a lot of these animals that move the pollen from one male flower to a female flower in order for that pollination fertilization process to happen. Um, so there are, uh, as I said, a lot of different pollinate types of groups of animals that are considered pollinators. I want to show you quickly a couple quick examples of some of the ones that we see here in Brooklyn Bridge Park. So we got some little animal representations, little models. So the monarch butterfly, very, very important pollinator that we see all throughout Brooklyn Bridge Park. Also the swallowtail butterfly, pretty common pollinator that we see in the park as well. As I mentioned before, hummingbirds. Now the ruby fruit hummingbird is the native uh, hummingbird that's found here in Brooklyn. They like to uh, drink the nectar out of this beautiful red flower called the cardinal flower. They have their really, really long beak that allows them to dip down deep into that flower and reach the nectar. Not all birds have that long beak and not all birds really want to drink nectar. So that's why specifically hummingbirds are considered pollinators. Most other bird species 
don't really hop around from flower to flower for that same purpose. Of course, we have our bees, honeybees and bumblebees, both pretty uh, popular bees here. There's a bee called the mallow bee that helps pollinate a lot of the wild roses that we see here in Brooklyn Bridge Park. If you've ever seen those big, really pink ro roses um, that, that are blooming right now in the park, we gotta thank our bees for their help with those. Even moths are considered pollinators. So there's this um, really cool pollinator that's actually called a hummingbird moth. And the hummingbird moth has coloration looks like this, a little bit of green, but mostly um, brownish red and, and white color. So they do some pollination in the park as well. Of course, lady beetles. There's a very special type of ladybug that is found in Brooklyn Bridge Park that only has two spots, the two-spotted ladybug. And we'll see ladybugs on uh, a lot of different types of flowers, but I think the one that they most commonly pollinate is uh, the magnolia flower, I believe. Yeah, so the magnolia flowers we'll find these guys on. And then beetles, there are so many different types of beetles. I don't even know how many beetles are in Brooklyn Bridge Park. I'm sure it's quite a lot and um, a, lot of different, a lot of different types that, that pollinate um, in the park as well. So that's kind of an overview of the main types of animals that help pollinate. But let's take a, a closer look at what the anatomy are and the parts of the flower are. Haley's gonna come on and share with us a little bit about what happens when after that pollen goes to a new flower. Where does it go and what does it do? All right, hi everyone. I'm sit up here with this really cool model. Um, so this is a model of a flower, but we're also going to uh, split screen and share an actual flower on our microscope screen. So um, we'll just get that set up, but look at this diagram of a flower and check out some of those words there because they might be new words for you or maybe you've heard of them, but you didn't know what it was. Um, <clears throat> so we can definitely see the pollen grains uh, kind of off camera up here floating out of the flower. And I like how they're floating on this diagram because wind is also another way for pollen to get around. And you might know that if you have allergies because the, the wind is moving pollen around and pollen can be irritating to our sinuses. Um, so that is one way for pollen to get spread around. Okay, here's our lily flower under the microscope so we can follow along um, and see the actual parts of the flower as we talk about them. So Christina's zooming in on those little tiny pollen grains. So those are held in what's called the um, anther. This whole male part, there's actually two here on this diagram and there's many on the, uh, the flower itself. So that whole part with the stem and the anther at the top and the pollen grains is called the stamen. So the stamen is the, the male part of the flower. Um, so that pollen, that's where the, uh, the pollinators will come and they might get um, some of this pollen stuck to their bodies um, coming off of the anther. And then they'll move to another flower and that pollen will be stuck on their body somewhere. And they'll come to drink the nectar or in the case of the, uh, the ladybugs that Christina was talking about. So they actually um, don't drink nectar. The females sometimes do eat pollen um, when they are gravid. That means when they have eggs, um, when they're carrying the eggs of the new babies inside their body, they sometimes will want to eat the pollen. But they also are predators of these little tiny um, bugs called aphids. And aphids are always all over and underneath um, flowers. So they come in to eat those aphids and then they get covered with pollen and they go to a new flower and that's how they pollinate. Um, but when a bug like that lands on a flower to either drink the nectar or eat the pollen itself, uh, they are going to be drinking nectar from this female part called the pistil. Um, and it's usually very long and skinny um, at the top. So that's why bees, butterflies, and uh, the beaks of 
um, hummingbirds are so long and skinny so they can reach down into uh, that section of the flower to drink the nectar. But this is this whole thing is called the pistil. Now there are many parts of the pistil. So on the lily here under the microscope, it's very, very long and very, very skinny. So it stands out from the anthers that are covered in pollen because it's so, so long. Um, and inside of that pistil, uh, the stigma is the opening part. Um, <clears throat> the pollen tube, so when pollen touches the top, it will grow down into the pollen tube where it will fertilize the uh, eggs or ovules inside of the ovary of the flower. So there's the stigma, the opening, the pollen tube, the ovary, and the ovules or eggs inside of the, um, the whole pistil itself. Uh, there are sometimes these little leaflets on the side, they're called um, septals, and they just help support the petals of the flower. So the petals are very, very important as well. The reason that flowers are so beautiful to look at and have so many different colors is that the pollinators, the insects and the birds, um, are attracted to brightly colored things. Uh, they know that's where they're gonna find good food to eat. Uh, so petals are really beautiful and all of these brightly colors. They also, um, this lily is a great example of how the color changes. It's like a darker color on the edge of the flower and it even has like these yellowish um, lines running down the center of the petal and it's lighter colored sort towards the middle of the petal. That's all directing insects to come straight down to this area. It's like arrows pointing to where they're going to find the best food. Yeah. Ooh. So there's a little tiny, some sort of fly in there. So we said that flies are pollinators. Um, we just picked this flower outside and yeah, it looks like it has a couple of different active pollinators hanging out there. So bees um, and butterflies are uh, probably the most common pollinators, but there, if you start to look closely at flowers, you'll see all sorts of insects attracted there. Cool. So we can also check out, well, eventually um, the eggs, so the pollen comes down the pollen tube and fertilizes the ovules or the eggs. And then once those eggs are fertilized, the flower is no longer needed. The petals will, they, you might know that flowers only last a limited amount of time. The petals eventually will um, dry up and uh, the stamens um, and the anther will sort of fall off. The stigma will eventually fall off or the top part of it. And this whole inside will grow into a fruit. Did you know that? Flowers become fruit. And I've noticed recently since I learned this that I can even almost taste sort of a floral um, taste in certain fruits, like oranges, the pith, uh, the white part of oranges. If you just taste that, it tastes a little bit more bitter and you can almost taste the hint of like a floral, um, the way that flowers smell is the way that it, it kind of tastes to me, if that makes sense to you. Oh, uh, Christina has the, let's go back to the, um, the microscope, because Christina has the ovary part of the lily opened up. So we can see the inside. So now we're looking at this ovary part inside of the pistil. So she, she cut the flower open and she peeled back some of these outer layers. And that little tiny green node that's sticking out there um, has the eggs inside of it. So eventually, um, what I was getting at is that flowers will, this uh, ovary part will turn into fruit and there will be seeds created inside. So really that's what's happening with a flower. Um, some flowers like the, the lily we were just looking at, they don't really create a fruit, they just create seeds and then those seeds will get dispersed probably by the wind. Um, or maybe animals will eat them and move them around. 
but a lot of flowers turn into fruit. So the eggs are created inside with the fertilization and then um, the outside of the ovary kind of creates what's known as a fruit. And fruits can look very different depending on species of plant. Um, we have all sorts of examples of different types of fruit in Brooklyn Bridge Park, but one of the most exciting ones that is uh, right, right now are service berries or June berries, um, also shad berries. They have many um, common names. So if you see some trees with these little tiny, they might be reddish, those are underripe. You know they're ripe when they turn to a dark um, purple or even blackish color. So these are service berries, June berries, um, shad berries, a plant that goes by many different names, but um, a very prolific uh, producer of these berries um, throughout the park. And these are found in many different uh, parts of the world, actually. There are, Christina just looked it up, how many species? 25 species of, um, sorry, I don't know the scientific name of this plant, <laughs> it would be more helpful if I knew the uh, genus name, but there's 25 species of service berries um, found throughout the world. And uh, their name, they have all of those different names probably because it is, there are so many different kinds um, and, and found in so many different parts of the world. So these are the flowers of the service berry that were blooming a couple of months ago. They bloom pretty early and they fruit pretty early um, compared to some other types of trees where we don't really see the fruits until um, late summer or early fall. Um, and these service berries are actually edible. So I don't recommend just going around and picking out any berries. You would have to look, look it up and really know what type of um, tree you're looking for. But uh, if you do learn that on your own and you want to, and you see them growing throughout the park, we definitely walk around and eat some of the June berries sometimes. Um, at least the ones that we can reach. They're definitely great food for all of the birds um, and other and squirrels and other animals that live in the park as well. So next we're going to look at a couple of common types of pollinators uh, found in the park. So I think we have some lady, whoop, there she goes crawling out. I think we have a couple of lady beetles to look at under the microscope. We're going to have to look quickly because they are pretty fast and we don't want them flying all over our room, we want to make sure we get them back outside after this. So um, these are, maybe put it in a smaller container with a lid on it. So this is a lady beetle crawling around here. Um, and like I said, they, females will eat pollen, but they really like to eat aphids, which are found growing on a lot of flowers. And then that little one um, on the leaf that's not moving around is a larva. Actually, it hasn't moved at all, so it might be an exoskeleton of the larva. So I can't tell. It might have been um, the last larval stage and a adult lady beetle uh, crawled out of that old exoskeleton. I, I'm thinking that's what's going on with that one. But that's cool though. If it's not actually alive, then we can keep that and look at it um, with other groups as well. So beetles actually go through metamorphosis just like bees and just like butterflies. I'm, probably, I'm sure everyone knows that butterflies go through a major life change, right? They start out as a caterpillar, which is known as their larval stage, or sorry, they start out as an egg, and then hatches out a caterpillar, um, their larval stage, and then they will go and make a chrysalis or a cocoon and turn into a butterfly leader. Um, and metamorphosis also happens with bees and with beetles as well. We just don't always learn about it the same sort of way um, because a lot of beetles spend their larval stage or their like cocoon stage underground um, and then they'll, they'll emerge as a full grown beetle. But you can really see the difference between that, that ladybug larva and the, uh, the full grown ladybug. And same thing happens with bees too. Bees, um, all of this happens inside of a hive in the case of honeybees 
or um, another type of home environment that different sorts of bees might build. So um, we hardly ever see bee larva, but it does look completely different than the adult. They, they go through metamorphosis as well. Some, animal, some uh, animals, their, their baby stage, they look pretty much the same. They just, they just grow bigger over time, like, like us, right? But um, a lot of insects do metamorphosis as they grow. So here are some moths. Um, not sure what type of moths these are. We just found them in um, the education center. So somehow they got inside uh, and they died, but now we can see um, parts of their body. So moths, not all moths are, uh, are pollinators because a lot of moths are nocturnal, right? Um, but there are some and they're very similar to, they're in the same group of insects as um, butterflies. And some of them have that, that long uh, tongue that they use to eat um, nectar inside plants. Moths also have these really long fuzzy antenna that they use to find mates. So I think that's what we're looking at there is one of the antenna. Is there a special word that's used to describe the mouth of these Yeah. Um, I wish we had a model that showed it, but um, a butterfly's uh, tongue is usually held curled up in a little spiral next to its face, and then it can uncurl that, and it's like a little straw that they drink the nectar with. It's called a proboscis. Um, so butterflies and some moths have a proboscis that they use to, to drink um, their nectar. Uh, let's look at, I think we have some bees to check out next. So bees are by far the most prolific uh, pollinators. They pollinate the most plants um, out of any other species of pollinator, especially honey bees more than anything else. Um, so these are honey bees. Uh, honey bees are actually um, not native, they are, were introduced from Europe, um, but they are super important to our agricultural system now, and we wouldn't have many of the fruits and um, nuts that we like to eat and are able to grow here if it weren't for bringing um, honeybees over here. And uh, people usually are pretty mindful about how they keep honeybees um, and this is a type of bumblebee. So there's many species of bumblebee. I don't know exactly what kind. Uh, they're a little bit bigger, a little bit fuzzier, um, and more black than brown. So the honeybees are kind of like a golden brown, yellow color. Bumblebees have um, black bodies with yellow stripes or a yellow back. Uh, we actually caught a bumblebee outside today. Um, there are hundreds of different types of bees around the world and even in New York City. And this bumblebee was busy on a flower. We're gonna let it go as soon as we're done talking here today. But you can see the pollen held on its legs. So it's gonna go back to its home and feed that pollen to the larva, the babies. Um, and honeybees definitely uh, collect that pollen on their legs as well. So it's kind of calmed down a little bit so we can, we can check it out here inside the container. I'm not gonna open it up because it's gonna go flying around the room and I wanna make sure that um, I get it back outside when we're done here so it can go back to its home. Sorry, I'm having trouble finding the camera. There we go. So check out that pollen that it's holding on its legs. So bees, I think, are probably the most prolific uh, pollinators because they drink nectar, the adults, but they collect the pollen and bring it back to their babies. So they're very purposeful about strategically placing pollen on their bodies, and then they go to another flower, and some of it inevitably falls off onto that flower. Um, so they are... They are trying to collect pollen. Other 
pollinators are just trying to drink nectar and they inadvertently get pollen on themselves and get it spread around. But I think that's why bees are probably um, so, so important for pollination. Little bumblebee, so wave at the bees next time you're in the park and you see them flying around. Do we have another, something else to look at? Oh, we can feed the ladybug some aphids. So when we picked up the ladybug today, we made sure to grab some of its favorite food, these aphids. Um, these are red aphids. Sometimes we see yellow ones, or usually we see yellow ones. Um, but this is what the ladybug is looking for on those flowers. Um, <clears throat> so it's an, a, an insect eater, a carnivore, typically. Although, oh, and there she is. She's crawling around looking for them. So this ladybug has something going on with its wings. Um, they can fly those two wings on their back with the red and black dots um, are kind of like an outer covering. And then underneath, you can see on this one uh, that it's opened up there. Underneath it has um, the wings that it uses to fly. And this ladybug on the microscope, one of its wings is sticking out underneath there. So it didn't fold up inside correctly, but there she is hunting. She got one. Very cool. Uh, do I have a question? Uh, someone wants to know, do flowers last longer if they're not pollinated? Mm. I don't know the answer to that. Possibly, depending on the flower. I would have I would have to look that one up. That's a good question. Do you have a favorite flower or pollinator in the park? Mm, I love looking at all the bees right now, for sure. Um, yesterday we saw like four bees in one rose. So they were all in there trying to get all of the pollen on that rose. Um, so I think all the bees are super cool. Like I'm just starting to learn some of the different species of bees and being able to tell them apart. Um, and a favorite flower in the park. Hmm. I think those ones we saw today, we saw prickly parrot cactus blooming um, at Pier 6 today. These big yellow flowers, a really like pale yellowish color. Um, and the flowers are really, really big on the cactus. So I, I wonder if people even realize that cactus, cacti are uh, flowering plants as well. And they need pollinators just like anything else. They're lower to the ground. So I read at least out west that um, like in the desert where it's too hot for butterflies and uh, bees to live. Um, cac a lot of cactus plants are, cacti are pollinated by ants and beetles, things that are lower to the ground and like climb up onto um, the cactus and pollinate them that way. Great questions. Do we have anything else? Um, where can we see pollinators? Where can we see pollinators in the park? All over. Wherever you see plants blooming, you'll find pollinators in the park, for sure. So all of the piers that have a lot of flowers on them. Pier 6 is a great place to look. Um, pier 1, Pier 3, and all of the uplands throughout the park. Over where we are here in the Main Street area, there's a lot of um, pollinators over here too. Great questions. Well, thank every, thank you everybody for tuning in. Um, if you enjoyed this program, you will really enjoy our pollinator webinar happening next Wednesday on June 23rd at 7 p.m. Um, with Rebecca McMacken, the um, head horticulturist here in the park. Um, and she really knows her stuff about pollinators. So come back with those questions for her and I'm sure she'll be able to answer them even better than I could. And we are also doing a family friendly 
um, pollinator scavenger hunt at Pier 6 on Saturday the 26th from 11 to 4. And you can check our website for both of those events um, and how to register and sign up for those. We put that link here at the bottom. Um, but check brooklynbridgepark.org um, events and you can also check our uh, education page that has even more information and virtual um, activities to do to learn more about pollinators. All right, thank you guys so much and have a great pollinator week.